uh, a lot of my fishing buddies back in the 70s and early 80s had mounts on the wall. And actually, there's a fish up there. Um, see that big fiberglass fish on the wall? That's the fish that got me into business. That's the one in 1984 when my fishing buddy Jackie won the derby. And uh, um, I took second with that fish. That was a 45 pounder. And I used to, you know, I used to sit at my fishing buddy's uh, house during the winter when we weren't fishing, and I used to just look at his mount and go, oh, I want a 50-pounder. I wish I had a mount on my wall, you know, when it was snowing outside and I'd just dream of fishing. Uh, so when we won the derby, that was the last year they had uh, bass in the derby, and of course I always wanted a 50-pounder, but it was 45. I thought, well, I better have it mounted. So I, I shipped the fish. I, well, we went over to Falmouth, and there was a man named Wally Brown, and he was the best in New England, and he did all fiberglass reproduction. So it took me about a year to get my fish back, and when I got it back, you know, it's beautiful. I looked at it, it's like, mm, this is beautiful, but I really wanted a skin mount. So I was working in the restaurant business at the time, as I'm you remember. Here. I was working at the home port, and um, you know, after 25 years of working in the restaurant business, and I was in my mid-30s, and it, I was getting to the point where it was time to either just get into management, you know, my old legs were hurting after running around like a little monkey at the home port. Um, so I thought, I was looking for something different to do. So I thought about, well, maybe I could be a, a skin taxidermist. And uh, actually I talked to um, uh, Spider Andresen and Kib Bromhall, who I loved Kib Bromhall. You know, when I first started fishing, I worked with his daughters at Helios, and he was just one of my heroes. So I remember they came in for dinner one night, and I told them, you know, I'm thinking about what would you think if uh, I went to school to become a um, taxidermist? And they thought it was the, a great idea. Um, Arnold Spofford actually helped me to find the school. He gave me some magazines, and um, I found the uh, Pennsylvania Institute of Taxidermy. It was the closest one to home, and I called them, and they were the only ones that would let me specialize in fish. You know, I told them I don't hunt. There's already some guys off island doing deer head. We don't have a lot of species here, and would they allow me to just specialize in fish? And so they said, yeah, come on. You know, they said, well, we mostly do freshwater fish, but we can teach you how to do saltwater fish. If, you, if I look in, I have some beautiful old taxidermy books, and they, they talk about when somebody came into a taxidermy shop, the taxidermist put away his tools. You know, for a long time, taxidermists didn't want to share any information. Like fishermen. Exactly like fishermen. It was great. You know, I learned in eight weeks what a lot of taxidermists spent 20 years trying to learn. What was the first fish you did? Oh, my God. Johnny Hoy gave me, I think, a 54-pound bass that he had caught. And Bob Post, my dear friend Bob Post, gave me, I think it was a 19-pound bluefish that he won the derby with. You know, I said, no, no, I'm not ready for this at all. Because when I went to school, I just, I brought a few small bluefish, which at school they thought they were just the weirdest fish, you know, because they were nothing like the largemouth bass and all the freshwater fish. They were so sweet. Bob Post was so sweet to me, you know. He said, I trust you. He said, I know that you'll do a good job. But I tell you, that first bass that I worked on, they gave us some tools at school, a little scalpel and some little clippers and all these little tools. I worked on those first fish with those little tools. I, you know, the right tool for the right job. It took me a while to figure out that you can use the same tools but much bigger to work on these fish. Did they both turn out well? Johnny Hoy's fish, well, it had a little bit of a smell in it because I think there's some place way in the head that I didn't get to. There was probably a little chunk of meat there somewhere. He didn't care. He absolutely, it really came out beautiful. I mean, when I saw it again, I thought, oh my God, this fish came out good. Bob's bluefish, the shape of it isn't what I'm really proud of, but, you know, for my very first bluefish, it wasn't bad. And he loved it. You know, he really loved it. Well, the first thing I do is I make a pattern of the fish on craft paper. Um, uh, if it's a world record, I try to get a lot of caliper measurements, you know, in millimeters so that I have it really pretty close to the, its exact size. And I lay the fish on the craft paper and I do the side pattern and then I stand it up 
so that I do it, you know, up and down. I don't know what that's called, lateral, mm -hmm. a lateral pattern. That little one down there with the, the, the smaller, chunky one, the second one, yeah, the, the, bo the bottom one, that's sort of the, what I like. You know, it's sort of a natural, very natural. Its head is kicked out a little bit. It's, you know, it's got a little bit of an S shape to it because that's how a fish swims. So anyway, I do the pattern. I do a, a, you know, a laying down pattern, and then I stand the fish up, and I curve it. If I'm going to do an S curve, I block it all up and try to do a little S curve, take a lot of measurements. Then I put my pattern aside, and then I, I figure out what side of the fish is going to show, and then I cut through the back of the fish. And Oh, actually, I just happen to have a fish here. I'll be done. This is a little black sea bass which he's in the process, or she's in the process right now. So you can see where I cut this fish down the back, and then I come in with a little, you know, various little cutters that I have, little flat knives with serrated edges, and I come in and I scrape in between the skin and, and the meat, and I take out that body of meat, that backbone that I talked about, you know, they have a backbone that runs through the fish into the back of the head where the brain is, that has to be chiseled out and then I, then the fish is kind of, the skin is open. Then all this is attached by bone in here. There's a lot of bone in here, so that's a lot of picking, little pieces of, um, that has to be clipped. The bones have to be clipped down close to the skin. On the, I'm on the inside. And, and get in there and cut that bone. Before you can open up the skin, you have to do that. Then I take out all the meat out of here. And then the, the hardest part, especially on a big fish like this, I could probably spend, I've spent as much as six hours in a big head. Uh, fish's head because you have to get underneath the tongue up where the brain is and you, it, you have to go quite a ways in there so the certain bone that you do leave because you want to keep the the um, you know the actual shape of the head so you know working in this direction and you're trying not to flap it around too much you know you come in there and you clean that out underneath the tongue in the head so once it's all scraped so that's called skinning and scraping the esophagus st stays in because that's basically a cartilage, you know, but you have to scrape it all off and get any meat off of it. So that's a, you know, it's kind of a big job to, to skin and scrape this. I could probably do this in about two and a half, three hours to get this all nice and cleaned out. You know, that's one, this is one process that you don't want to skimp at. You want to get all that stuff out of there. And a bass like that big one there. I would say it's a full day's work. Um, if it comes in fresh and I have time to work on it, then I'd rather do that. A lot of times people would ask for the fish back. So if I could return that body of fish, uh, fresh fish for them, so then, you know, they could mount their fish and eat it too. But if not, it goes into the freezer and then, you know, the fish is still edible. You know, my cats ate good and my neighbors ate good. So, you know, there's not much that goes to waste. So, so now at this point, you have it doesn't even look like a fish anymore. You know, I have the head, but everything, all the skin is just kind of hanging, and you know, there's no form to it. At that point, it gets put into a degreaser. Um, I use um, white Coleman fuel, and it can go in anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours for a fish this size. Or I could leave a fish like this in overnight. You know, eight, twelve hours. What do you put it in a pot? Or? Yeah, I have some big tubs. You know, you don't have to fill them up to the top, just enough to um, cover the fish. And the nice thing about that, that's the most toxic product that I use. And yet, I can use it over and over again. All the oil goes and sinks to the bottom. And then I can pour off the good gas, and then just I just have to get rid of, like on a fish like this, I might have a little half a cup, not even a half a cup of oil with a little gas mixed into it. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, toxic waste. Uh, once it's been degreased, I put it in my tan. The tan basically is um, household products, borax, salt, glycerin, which is a product in soap. Um, I guess that's a softener. I use uh, that brown Lysol bacteria, you know, that kills the bacteria in it, um, and uh, zinc sulfate. And I, the zinc sulfate, I've seen it in aspirin. I always say that it's, you use that because you don't want your fish to get a headache. But I don't, I'm not quite sure what that is. It's some sort of a drying agent. So I mix that in a big tub of water, and then the fish gets soaked in the tan. 
and that can stay anywhere from you know a week. I've had fish, you know, in in the tan for maybe more than two weeks when I haven't been able to get the bodies ready. But a bit fish this size, you want to leave it in at least a week, so it really gets saturated with the borax and the salt. And while it's in the tan, then I start making a body. I use this foam. It's a carving foam. Um, it's called dustless. Then with my patent, I do a lot of um, measuring and drawing lines on it, and I sit around, I cover it, cut it with a um, uh, fet fillet knife, you know, I do some carving, and uh, you know, once I get it to fit the fish, it's ready to, I put a piece of wood in it, so that that can be screwed to the wall, because you can't screw anything to the foam, it's too light, so I install a, that, and then um, I take my fish out of the tan, wash it off, you know, wash all the um, tan off of it. I've had a lot of employees. I could get them to skin and scrape, do uh, some of the finish work, some of the uh, fin work, even setting eyeballs and, you know, building up certain areas. But this was, it's very really crucial when you're putting the fish on the body. If it's not right at that point, you can't ever correct it. You know, so that was something I always ended up doing by myself. But you wrap that wet skin around the... Um, around the body. I put a hide paste on it. It's this sticky stuff. It's sort of creamy. And then slip the foam into it. Use a lot of paper mache to fill in areas like the cheek meat that came out of here and the eyeballs. And little places in the head where you can't get your foam. So I fill it with paper mache and then sew it up. And you know, get that as close as you can. I actually sculpt in scale so they won't even see this after when I'm when I'm done. This is the stuff that I laminate with. It's called BioBond. Kind of looks like Elma's glue. Could have got a bigger paintbrush, I guess. And this is going to turn to a plastic. You know, this is the silk span, which is a really fine. Let's see if I can get that on you. Okay, now this is the trick I learned in the magazine. Watch this. So anything that's not wet is going to burn. <sighs> Look at the beautiful edge on the fin. Even when I was in school, we couldn't do that. And it took like, you know, a whole day of sitting there with all my fish trying to cut little things with a scalpel and... See that? Voila! So I have a finished bass. Is this all right there? So what I did with the fish, um, I actually got permission. The derby, the, when they first put bass back in the derby, they didn't want to give any big prize and they were saying you know what what can we give so I said well why don't I I can make a little fiberglass fish and we could put it on a shield and you know we can offer that for a prize so the derby is like that's great so I got permission so since it's 20 well at the time it was 36 inches for a bass so I got permission from the state to keep one undersized bass and uh, oh my god you'd think I was committing murder you know, I had my little plastic bag and my little note from the state, and I was catching these undersized fish, and of course I wanted it to be just the most perfect uh, size and shape so that I could make a mold of it. So I, I was able to make this mold. This mold is really old now. It's from, uh, I don't know, if it's a 96? 2006, I think it's older than that. Uh, so what I did with the fish, when I caught the fish, I put the fish in a bedding. Uh, it's called high fiber. And it takes a lot of time to just make sure you got the fish halfway in. Then I pour, I put a release agent on it. Then I, this is simplified. Then you, I pour uh, a, a, a mixture of Bondo and fiberglass resin on top of the actual fish. And I let that dry. Then I flip it over, take the bedding off, and then the opposite side, uh, do the same thing, put a coating on it, and then pour your fiberglass resin and molding, um, fiberglass bondo and fiberglass resin, 
and then I would have like a fish that's sitting there rotting in this and then you take it apart, take your fish out and this is a mold. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I put little keys in there so that it matches up. And so what comes out of this, actually it looks like that in the beginning when I first take it out because you can see I have little fin, I molded the fins. So I coat this, I, I use a butcher's wax to wax it all up. I have another release agent and um, then I do a fiberglass layup on both sides, put a piece of wood in it so you have the piece of wood, then close them up and when you open it, you have something that looks like that. And then later when I'm done with that, it ends up looking like this. What so say if a customer came to me, say if you came to me and you said, uh, Janet, I, want, I just caught a shark, can you do a certain shark for me? And if I don't have the mold for it, I would call a company somewhere in the United States and buy a blank. In fact, those two um, mahi-mahi, that's what I did with these because I didn't have the mold for them. So that cost me $800 to get the blanks here. So when these came into my shop, they looked like that shark did. So, but, so what you're mounting then is not the fish they caught? No, it has nothing to do with your fish. You don't, in, you know, I don't want to see the fish. So, so it's a replica of right. their fish. But you know, I mean, um, fiberglass has, a, has its purpose. A lot of catch and release guys that don't want to take a fish now, you know, you could do a fiberglass reproduction for, for them. And you can say, he, uh, someone can say to you, I caught a 42 pound bass. Right. Make me a... Right. Pound. And there's enough companies around that that's all they do. They're not taxidermists, they're supply companies. But I could, this, since this company is new that does these, I caught the fish and I sent it down to them in Texas. I froze it and sent it overnight. So it cost me $100 just to send it down overnight, frozen. And then they made a mold of it. So now they own the mold and they sent me the first one out of the mold. So that one is kind of a real fish. Yeah, this is a real one for me. But now if a customer came to me and said I caught like a 30 some, what is it, I don't know, 28 pound fish, I could give them one of those.